Thank you for joining me, friend. Let us continue reading this book by J.A. Wiley. We are now chapter 12. Intrigues of the Jesuits in England, etc. Our Father in heaven, bless the reading of this book today. I pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We began with Sweden. In 1576, at a critical moment in the Reformation of that country, Two Jesuits, Florentius Fayette and Lawrence Nicolai, arrived in Stockton, Stockholm. They gave themselves out for Lutheran ministers. They came furnished with a license to preach high Calvinism with a, with a view of bringing back the Swedish flocks to the deserted fold of Rome. The strangers who spoke an elegant Latinity appeared very devout, and the simple and suspicious pastors admitted them into their pulpits. At the University of Uppsala, they spread out their nets, and by lectures, disputations, and conversations, succeeded in bringing back not one, now one, now another, to the Romish faith. Cardinal Husius, the leading Jesuit of Poland, instructed them to extol faith to the sky, skies to declare that Works without faith were prophetless. To preach Christ as the only Savior and His sacrifice on the cross as the only sacrifice that saves. This accomplished some way would afterwards be found of setting Mary by the side of Christ in the sacrifice of the Mass, by the side of the sacrifice of the cross. As soon as the king, John III, and the principal Swedes had been won over, the Jesuits throw off the mask. They no longer gave themselves the trouble by professing Calvinism, either high or low. The deprivation and exile of ministers, the fining and imprisoning of laymen, were found speedier and more effectual methods of conversion. Happily, in the end, they did not succeed. Jesuit foot first touched the soil of England in 1549. Edward VI was then on the throne, and the country under its young master, counseled by Calvin, was seeking to free itself from the yoke of Rome. Two Jesuits in disguise hastened across from Holland. Their lessons already taught them to prevent, if possible, the threatened loss of, a, of so great a kingdom to the papal see. They began to preach the tenets of the Anabaptists and to proclaim the advent of the fifth monarchy or kingdom of the saints, a doctrine which had deluged many parts of Germany with blood. The scare of an Anarchy was thought the likeliest to frighten England from entering the path of the gospel. There soon came a rest upon the English Reformation from another quarter. On the demise of Edward, Mary ascended the throne. It was no longer necessary for Jesuit or other agent of the papacy to wear disguise of any sort. The most open and violent measures would, were those which found most favor with the queen and her counselors. But these ev evil days came at last to an end. Although, alas, not till the flower of the English reformers had died at the stake. But why should we grieve for their deaths? Had their blood not watered it? Would the Reformation of England ever had have attained a godly stature which it reached in the Puritan age? We will read the next pages the next time. May God our Father we bless you and His only begotten divine Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious to you now and forevermore. Amen.